There's only six chapters in Ephesians, so we are uh, getting close. This particular passage would have been one of those that would have been so much easier just to skip. Like, how in the world does this apply to us? Why in the world do we need to hear this message? It doesn't make sense. But I, this particular message reminds us of what Scripture teaches about our responsibility to serve the Lord. We talk about identity. Ephesians is all about our identity in Christ. And we have all this great lofty picture. And then Paul reminds us of another part of our identity, and that is as Jesus as Lord and Master and us as servant, and the word is actually even slave. So Ephesians chapter 6, beginning with verse 5 this morning, Paul had just wrote to husbands and wives, he just wrote to children and parents, and now he writes specifically to slaves and their masters, and he says, Slaves, obey your human masters with fear and trembling. In the sincerity of your heart, as you would Christ. Don't work only while being watched as people pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, do God's will from your heart. Serve with a good attitude as to the Lord and not to people, knowing that whatever good each one does, slave or free, he will receive this back from the Lord. And masters, Treat your slaves the same way, without threatening them, because you know that, here's the key phrase, that both their master and yours, notice master is capitalized, it's referring to God here, that their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism in him. And we've been talking, and if you missed it, you can get on YouTube and kind of catch up. We've been talking about how the kingdom of God is really displayed in our relationships. Paul had first talked about husbands and wives, then he talked about children and parents, and now he talks to slaves and masters, and we could even say, to a lesser degree, to employer and employees. But the key point here is this, that our relationship with those that we live and work with is where the kingdom of God is most clearly visible. It's not on a church platform that we see the kingdom of God at its best, but instead it's in our homes and in our workplaces and in our community. Sundays can be kind of easy. It's sometimes it's getting ready for Sundays that is hard. Don't raise your hand, but how many of you have gotten in a fight with your kids or your spouse before church this morning? It happens a lot. Why do you think that is? Yeah, please don't raise your hand. Spiritual warfare. Just, just whatever you do on Sunday morning, as one of the spouse or one of the kids is, is just not cooperating and things aren't going, whatever you do, do not look at them and say, get behind me, Satan, because that will not end well. And when you come to me for marriage counseling, I'm going to be like, you're an idiot. Man, but it's, it's through our relationships where the kingdom of God is most practiced, it's most tested, and it's most tried. And that's why Paul is talking about these three big key relational categories. And yet the apostle Paul gives commands and instructions to three groups of people that he doesn't participate in. For example, he wasn't a husband, but yet he gives advice to husband. He wasn't a parent, and yet he gives advice to parents. And he definitely was not a slave. In fact, the book of Acts tells us that Paul was born a citizen of Rome, a free person. He was part of the elite in the Roman Empire. Paul was one of the select few with privileges and rights that all the world at the time only dreamed of. And so by our standards, Paul is the least qualified person to advise married couples, parents, slaves, or masters. Have you ever noticed, anybody in here bought a book recently? Nobody. Okay, two of you. Thank you. And whenever you read a book, one of the first things that I do is I look at, I see who the author is, and I'll flip on the back, and there'll be a short bio. And when I'm reading the bio, I want the person to at least have some experience and expertise in what we're talking about. I get cracked up, especially, you know, I read a lot of ministry books, and there'll be some punk kid, 24 years old. I used to be there. I'm not anymore. And we say, yeah, Paul has one year of experience. And I'm like, huh, that's so funny. 
that's not experience. You're still wet behind your ears. I, I just discovered what that meant the other day. It's weird. But usually when, we go, usually when we go to advice, we want someone who has experience and they know what they're talking about. And yet the Apostle Paul seems to be the least likely person to give advice to these people. And yet, God uses Paul as the medium for these divine truths in ways that he doesn't use anybody else. And so my question as I approach this text, I can't help but ask, what if the Apostle Paul was more qualified than we realize? What if Paul understood each of these arenas? Spousal marriage, parenthood, slavery. What if he understood these areas in ways that was very unique and profound? What if Paul understood these with a deeper reality? And I believe that the Apostle Paul saw himself in all three of these categories, all three of these situations. First of all, he was part of the church, therefore, That makes him a member of the bride of Christ. Therefore, his job was to submit to the husband who is Jesus. Paul understood that he was a co-heir with Christ Jesus. And although we are not divine, we are not little gods, we have this phrase called sons of God. Thus, Paul's life was a constant endeavor to honor and obey his heavenly father. And then we see, thirdly, that Paul, the Roman citizen consistently and constantly identifies as a slave to Christ. With all the lofty language that Paul employs in his letters, he never forgets that he served at the privilege of the Master Jesus. And I believe this is a helpful balance for us. Because amazingly, we are both co-heirs with Christ Jesus, and at the same time, we are servants of Jesus. In eternity, we will receive crowns of glory, and then in the moment that they are awarded to us, the next moment we're throwing them at Jesus' feet. It's this divine paradox. Co-heirs with Christ Jesus, seated with Him at the right hand of the Father, and yet we are also servants of Jesus, our Lord. It's not one or the other, it's both. Both, all these things are part of our identity in Christ Jesus. So Paul's instructions for spouses, children, and slaves provide a framework that shape our relationship with Jesus. Things like submission and love, honor and obedience, diligence and sincerity are a few of the attitudes that these relationships teach us. Because relationships with others are key elements of our discipleship. The running joke is, pastoring would be easy if it wasn't for the people, but it wouldn't be pastoring. Leadership would be easy if it wasn't for the people, but then it wouldn't be leadership. If nobody's following you, then you're not the leader. Regardless of our desires and dreams to drive a thousand miles west and find a place where nobody is and set up shop there, I know most of you have that fantasy, as much, because I've noticed us rural people, So my sister lives in Jacksonville, Florida. City people go to the city for vacation. Rural people go to very rural places for vacation. We'll drive to a place, and if there's more than four people gathered together, we're like, that's too crowded for me. (laughs) Heard the other day in Republic, they opened a Whataburger, and people stood in line for hours for our burger, and I'm like, no! Went to Popeye's yesterday in Springfield after teaching. There was nobody in there. There was a reason why nobody was in there, but at least I was by myself. (laughs) But relationships is where the kingdom of God works itself out and in. We have to be around people. They're part of our sanctification process at times, it feels like. So as Paul looks at the third category... How in the world, why in the world does this apply to us in 21st century America? Well, many of you know that I have a history bent to me. So the first thing I do as I'm reading a passage is I want to understand what did slavery look like in the Roman Empire. And it's important to have this kind of informed perspective because slavery was absolutely predominant in the Roman Empire. Let me explain. Slaves during that time came from varied places and backgrounds. And the main source of slavery was conquered peoples. Wherever Rome Rome went, they would usually bring back the best and turn them into slaves. 
Babylonians did it, the Greeks did it, Persians did it. It's throughout history. That's just what they have done. And so in the Roman Empire, the number one slave group was Greeks because for one, the Romans were always fighting the Greeks and two, they were pretty intelligent. Some people were born into slavery. Others sold themselves into slavery due to debts to be paid. But unlike 19th century America where slavery was predominantly one racial group, slaves in this day and time could come from any nationality, race, or people group. Therefore, it could be very hard to tell a freed person or a citizen from a slave, as we see in the example of the Apostle Paul in Acts, when they thought he was a local slave, but when they found out he was a Roman citizen, they stopped beating him. And not all slavery situations were the same. The worst, absolute, the worst form of slavery was in the mines of the empire, where your life was measured in hours and days and not years and decades. In fact, later on, around the 2nd and 3rd century, under the emperor Valerius, the, the emperor went around to the, to the Christian leaders, and he did two things. First thing, is that, first thing is they did is they gave him a stigma, which is the ancient word for a tattoo, on their forehead. And it said, condemned to the mines. And then they took the leadership of the church and they condemned them to the mines where they died a short period thereafter. It was said of the ancient Christians that they were marked twice. First, they were marked by the invisible mark, the invisible tattoo of their baptism. And secondly, they were marked at the hands of Rome to be marked as Christians with a cross. Paul's audience understood slavery at a level that we do not understand. In fact, slavery was absolutely vital to the Roman Empire. According to the British Museum, uh, between 10 and 20 percent of the population of Roman cities, cities in Rome were slaves. So it could have been millions of people. Five to ten million people were in slavery at any one time in, a Roman, in the Roman Empire. So everywhere Paul went, Ephesus, Rome, Colossae, Philippi, everywhere he went, there was people who were both slaves and slave owners. Some worked in wealthy households, having a little bit better job than others. Some worked on the farms, some worked in the mines, but they all had this in common. Their slavery meant that someone else owned them, and they were their property. We don't know much about slavery in the Roman Empire. I mean, we're talking 2,000 years ago. There's a, there's a little bit of writings still left, and all the writings say basically the same thing. All the writing that we have in, left in history is really talking about how bad the slaves were, right? Like, we don't ever write anything good about people. You look at a review of a restaurant, nobody ever writes about the good service they had. They always write about the bad service. The Romans probably invented Yelp because they only wrote about all the bad servants that they had. But we do have some of those things. And consistently, slave masters complained about their slaves being bad, disloyal, lazy, or deceitful people. And so now it kind of makes sense why the Apostle Paul would say, hey, for those of you who are now saved but you find yourself in slavery, make sure you work hard with a good attitude. Because when your master writes your story, you don't want that story to say he was lazy, he was awful, he was terrible, he was deceitful. You want the master to say, I saw Jesus in you. Dare I say that there are people who are writing parts of your story right now and you're giving them ammunition that instead of them saying, hey, they are a follower of Jesus, they were honest, they were truthful, they were a good person, instead they're saying, hey, I knew them and although they went to church, they were a hypocrite. Although they went to the church, they were lying. Although they were went to church, I couldn't trust them. Somebody is writing part of your story. And so we, whether we are husbands and wives, parents or children, employees or employers, we have a responsibility to show Jesus to the world. We may not have a physical mark on our body like the first Christians did that signified the cross, that showed everyone that we were believers. But I bet some of you got a bumper sticker on your car. Some of you are wearing jewelry with the cross. Some of you are going out there in one moment, we are saying, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. And the next moment we're lying and we're deceitful. Which story do you want to tell? So Paul is dealing with some people in Ephesus. And he's saying, hey, slaves, obey your masters and you better have a good attitude. Masters, do not mistreat your slaves because you're a Christian too. 
And the save, save, same Savior saved you both. In other words, the slaves' newfound freedom in Jesus did not give them permission to be lazy, disloyal, or deceitful. So why do we care? Why, why am I taking our time here today to preach this message? Because I had another message we could do. What are we missing when we read this passage of Scripture and we're like, eh, that doesn't apply to me. What are we missing here? Why did the Holy Spirit preserve this for you and I today? And I think it has to do with, with this connection of being a servant of Christ Jesus. In Romans chapter 1, Philippians chapter 1, and Titus chapter 1, as Paul is writing these letters, guess how he introduces himself? He writes, Paul, a bondservant or a slave of Christ Jesus. Now, that's an interesting way to introduce yourself. Now, I'm a firm believer that first impressions matter. We often lead with our greatest achievement, our greatest attributes, or we lead with what is, matters most. And so in these letters, Romans, Philippians, Titus, Paul starts with what he felt was the most important title that he had. And it was his title and position as servant of Jesus Christ. The word Paul uses for servant is dualos, and it just means slave. We kind of water it down and soften a bit in English, but in their day, slave was a slave was a slave. Different degrees of slavery and servanthood, but it was the same word. Paul writes, I, a slave of Christ Jesus. And each time the apostle refers to himself as a servant of Jesus, he is relating his condition and position to his tie to his master. You see, when the apostle Paul was saved, Jesus became his master and Lord. And we use that language all the time, don't we? Jesus is Lord. Do you realize what you're saying? If Jesus is my Lord, then that means I am his servant. If he is the master, then I am the slave. If he's the owner, if he's the boss, then I work for him. I am his bond servant. That language is all throughout Scripture. And what that meant for the Apostle Paul and what it should mean for it, us is this, is that where Jesus told Paul to go, that's where he went. What Jesus told him to do, he would do. What Jesus commanded him to say, he would say. Paul's life was not his own, but instead it was wrapped up in Christ. And it's crucial to remain mindful of both our privilege and position and not let it lead to us to become conceited or prideful or overconfident. The Apostle Paul was confident in his position. He knew who he was in Christ Jesus. He was seated with Christ at the right hand of the Father. The Apostle Paul enjoyed the privilege of walking worthy of God's calling. The Apostle Paul saw miracles. He spoke with kings and leaders. He caused riots and was used to write Scripture. He had all of the qualifications and all of the titles to his name, and yet one of his favorite introductions was Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus. Where does he get this from? He gets this from his role model that he writes about in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2 says it like this. He writes to the church, he's saying, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Well, what was that attitude? That though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges, one says. He emptied himself. He took the humble position I like the New Living Translation here. The humble position of a slave. And was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God, and he died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name that is above all other names. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will profess that Jesus Christ is what? Lord. Lord. To the glory of the Father. Now, the men and women of Ephesus understood lordship better than we do. Many of them, if not all of them, had sworn oaths at the temple of Artemis. 
and they had sworn oaths to the temple of the Roman Empire. In fact, Augustus Caesar is perhaps one of the first people in history to adopt the title of, guess what, King of Kings and Lord of Lords before Jesus' birth. Before Jesus' birth, Caesar declared himself to be Lord of Lords. So every Roman soldier, every Roman citizen was expected to treat the emperor, Caesar, as his Lord. He was the master, and the people were his slaves. And then Jesus comes along, and he says, no, 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 there's only one king, and there's only one Lord. So you choose this day who you're going to serve. You can't serve all the other gods. You can either serve me, or you can serve the world, but you can't serve both. And now that they were followers of Jesus, they were now called to confess Jesus as their Lord and as their master. And here's the part that is so weird for us. And this is why I'm sharing a lot of extra scripture today. Because the Apostle Paul spoke in such a way and he taught in such a way that this idea of Jesus as Lord and us as being his servants or his slaves is to be part of our identity. Now, I know this seems wrong to us, especially in our day and age where we're all about making things happen. We are free people. We are citizens. We're ta- all of those things apply. Paul was both a citizen of heaven and also a servant of Jesus. He was a co-heir with Christ Jesus, and he also was a slave to him. They're not contradictory. Instead, it's part of the bigger picture. And so Paul, throughout all of his letters, is teaching the people how to follow Jesus. And in Romans chapter 6, Paul writes this, What then? Should we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? Absolutely not. Don't you know that if you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one that you obey, either of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But thank God that although you used to be slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart that pattern of teaching to which you were handed over, and having been set free from sin, you became what? Enslaved to righteousness. Interesting. Paul says, I'm using a human analogy because of the weakness of your flesh. In other words, because this is what you understand. For just as you offered the parts of yourselves as slaves to impurity, And to greater and greater lawlessness, so now offer them as slaves to righteousness, which results in sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free with regard to righteousness. So what what fruit was produced then from the things that you're now ashamed of? The outcome of those things was death. But now, since you have been set free from sin and have become enslaved to God, You have your fruit, which results in sanctification, and the outcome is eternal life. And then a very familiar passage, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. There it is again. So here's what we need to realize. Our salvation through Christ is precipitated by our declaration of Jesus as Lord. In other words, you're not saved unless you confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Jesus does not become your Savior by declaring Him to be your buddy. I'm a little nervous in Christianity, especially this part of the country where we're very familiar, we're used to church, that we start calling God in terms that are not worthy of Him. He's not my buddy. He's my Lord. He's my master. Jesus says we can call him Abba Father, which is the heart cry of a child. There's the there's relationship there, but there's certain things that I'm not going to call Jesus. Just like there are still some things that I will not call my father, even though we have a great relationship. I might call him Pops. I might call him Dad. But I do not call him Ron. I don't know that he could still whip me but he might give it a try. But out of respect, dad is still dad. Out of respect, he is my father. And I might call him pops. But out of respect, there's things that I do not call him. So how is it that we think it's okay to call God things that are far below 
his rank and title. We are saved not because Jesus is our buddy or our grandpappy. We are saved by him being our Lord and Master. Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is what? Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Paul understood that the Christian life is a life of submission. That's why he can say in Ephesians 5, 21, submit to one another. Because the Christian life is a life of submission. Submit one to another. Wives, submit to your husbands. Slaves, submit to your masters. But most importantly, submit to Jesus. If you're not in submission with Jesus, you're not going to be in submission elsewhere. And it's not going to work. If you're not in submission to Jesus, you're not going to be in submission elsewhere. Now, I think many of us in this room are in the place where we have different parts of our body that gets out of whack, right? Anybody here go to chiropractor? Yeah. Yeah, some of you are just like, no, I'm not, it's not confession time. I've got one confession in me today, and that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> Isn't it amazing, though, how like if your knees are out, or if your hips are out, or your back is out, that everything else in your body is out of alignment? Or maybe, this is going to be a little bit more personal. How many of you in here has put on multiple pairs of new tires because you refuse to put the thing in alignment? <laughs> Man, I can't afford that $75 alignment, but I can afford $250 tires. Man, I just don't understand. They don't make tires like they used to. Well, it might be because if the front end is out of alignment, the tires don't wear even. Could it be that your relationship with your spouse, your relationship with your kids, or your relationship with your employers, or just life in general, is out of alignment because you're out of alignment with Jesus? Because if this is not right, if I'm not working on this, this is not going to be good. We've got to be in alignment both vertically and horizontally. But this will never be right if this is not right. got to submit to Jesus. You know, for those born free in Christ, Paul says that they are slaves. For those born in slavery in Christ, there is freedom. 1 Corinthians 7, 22 says, For he who is called by the Lord as a slave is the Lord's freedman. Likewise, he who is called as a free man is Christ's slave. In other words, if you were free when you found Jesus, count yourself as a slave. But if you find yourself in a position of slavery in this physical world, count yourself free in Jesus. The kingdom of God is full of all kinds of paradoxes like this. The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. In Christ, we are free to serve Christ. Paul wrote to the Roman church in Romans to present their bodies as living sacrifices. One of my favorite passages of Scripture, Romans 12.1. Now, some of the modern translations will say, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable under God, and then some of the new ones say, like, which is your spiritual worship? I grew up on King James. Like, there's just some things that are so memorable about the King James. It's very poetic. And I grew up memorizing at King James, which instead of saying this is your true worship, it says which is your reasonable service. Here's the thing about living sacrifices, and here's the thing about worship. See, worship, we feel like in America, is something that we can withhold when we don't want to. For example, you come in the church and you've had a bad weekend. Well, I'm going to go to church today, but I'm not going to worship the Lord. You can make me stand, but you can't make me sing. You can make me sing, but you can't make me lift my hands. You can make me listen to your sermon, or at least most of it. You can't make me go to the altar. I can be here, but I don't have to like being here. And so oftentimes, worship is something that we feel like we can withhold, kind of like what we believe we can do with love. We feel like love is something that we can withhold and weaponize. We feel like we can weaponize worship. Saying, well, Lord, I just had a bad week, so I'm not going to worship you today. Which is why I like the phrase, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service. Here's why that matters. Because anything the master asks the servant to do is reasonable. The Christians didn't have a union. They weren't told by their boss to go do something, and they went to their union rep and said, you can't make me do that. Slaves didn't have an employee handbook. 
that says, hey, this is not within the scope of my hiring, and if you want me to do this or work these hours, then we need to renegotiate our contract. Slaves didn't have that. They couldn't withhold their service. Therefore, when the master asked one of his servants to do something, whatever he asks of him is reasonable. Go to the mines and die. That's reasonable. Go take the message to a king, knowing the king kills bad, bad messengers. It's reasonable. Go stand, go get water, go fetch this. Whatever the master asks is reasonable. And I dare say that for us as believers, whatever the Lord asks us to do is reasonable. Whether it's walk across the street and to witness to a neighbor, or whether it's to go across the oceans and tell villages about Jesus, whether it's to share a testimony, or whether it's to go out and be the hands and feet of Jesus, whatever the Lord asks you to do is reasonable. I'm not sure where we got the idea that we can debate the reasonableness of our service to Jesus. Because when I gave my heart to Jesus and he called him, me into ministry, I said, Lord, I will go where you want me to go and I will do what you want me to do. I will say what you want me to say and I will be who you called me to be. I was just as prepared to go to a big city as I was to go to Licking, Missouri. Lord, wherever you'd go. In fact, the only condition I put upon my calling was, Lord, I will do whatever you want. Just don't have me do a building project. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. And the Lord said, okay. Three or four building projects later. But it's reasonable what he asked me to do. Of all the servants he could have asked to come to licking, he asked me. Of all the servants he asked to have some faith to go and build or to, to do this property, he asked me. So whatever you say, Lord, is reasonable. And I do believe the Lord is calling so many of us in this room to take a step of faith and obedience. And you've been debating with Jesus saying, Lord, I can't do that. And he's saying, if I ask you to do it, you can do it. Yes. It's not comfortable. Whoever said this thing is comfortable? Well, pastor, that makes me nervous. Well, good. That means you'll pray more often. A little bit of a discomfort is a good thing. Man, I've been trying to get in a little bit better shape. People tell me that 40, it's really bad, and I'm in between 35 and 40, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to go have a few good years left before all this doom and gloom you've been telling me about happens. <laughs> so I've been walking, bought me a pair of running shoes. I did some running the other day, and I'm like, oh, yeah, I can do this. So I got on my watch, and I'm like, I'm going to run for 27 minutes. So I sat down on my street there by Al Johnson's house. I got my good shoes on. I'm ready to go. I'm running. And then I start hurting. And I'm like, Lord, I can't do this. And I ran until I couldn't run anymore. And I looked down, it's four minutes. <laughs> four minutes? So I deleted that entry from my watch so Apple doesn't know that I failed by 23 minutes. So what did I do? I walked up and down the street for 25 minutes so the wife didn't know how big of a failure I was. <laughs> Whew. It's out now. But whatever the Lord tells us to do is reasonable. And it may be painful. It may be uncomfortable. It may be stretching, but when the Lord... When Jesus is our Lord and Master, what He asks me to do, I should do. And then we believe in His goodness, that His goodness will provide the help that I need. And the Word says that He is made strong in our what? Oh, not in your degree? I guess I got enough of them. Not in your skill sets? None of the books you've read? No, His strength is made strong in our weakness. So you know what that means to me? We need to be walking in some weakness. When the Lord calls us, it seems to be a little bit out of what you normally would want to do. Maybe that is God. Maybe that's God saying, hey, I'm leading you in this direction. And watch if you obey. So how do we live in light of this passage of Scripture? Three quick principles. My wife asked me the other day, I was talking to the dog, and I apparently... 
I, when I say something to the dog, I say it in threes. And she asked me about that. Why, where does that come from? I think as a preacher, we have to have at least three points. So I do everything in threes. How do we live in light of this passage? We're not slaves. Although there's an estimated like 48 million people living in slavery today. How do we live in light of this passage of Scripture? Number one, we live in light of Ephesians 6 when we realize that the why and the how matter. Here's what it says. Slaves, obey your human masters with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart as you would Christ. Do not work only while being watched as people pleasers, but as slaves of Christ. Do God's will from your heart. Serve with a good attitude as to the Lord and not to people, knowing that whatever good each one does, slave or free, he will receive this back from the Lord. Masters, treat your slaves in the same way without threatening them because you know that both their master and yours is in heaven and there's no favoritism with him. The first thing we see in this passage is that our why and our how matter. Slaves do not get to choose what they do. There were no job fairs for slaves to attend. Each slave performed the tasks that were assigned before them. For many of us in this room, you may not be able to choose everything you get to do at work or at home, but you can choose how you do it. You do, and you are in control of your attitude. You're an adult. You can control your attitude and how you do something. At work, you may not have much of a choice in what you must do, but you can choose how you do it. And so Paul says for us to work and serve in the sincerity of heart unto the Lord. What does this mean? If your job involves sweeping floors, do it for the Lord. If you care for kids, love them with every fiber of your being. Whatever you find yourself doing, whatever stage of life you are at, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with an attitude that brings God glory. Because principle number two, all of us get graded on attitude. (laughs) All of us get graded on attitude. Every single one of us. Now, as adults speaking to kids, we understand this. It's not just a matter that you want your kid to take the trash out. You want them to take it out in such a way that there's no slamming of doors, there's no stomping through the house, there's no mumbling underneath the breath, because why attitude matters. Yeah. Yeah. Attitude matters. But you know that applies for us adults too. There's some of you in here that are obedient with your hands, but you're disobedient with your heart. You may be doing what God has you doing in this season, but you sure don't like it. You know what one of the most dangerous sins in Scripture is? It's the sin of mumbling and complaining. Because mumbling and complaining leads to rebellion, and those are all heart issues. So you can be obedient with your hands, and you can be disobedient with your heart. It also works in marriage. You can be faithful with your body and unfaithful with your heart, but that's a different message for another day. All of us get graded on attitude. Don't work only while being watched as people pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, do God's will from your heart. Serve with a good attitude as to the Lord and not to people. You're not doing it for them. You're not doing it for the paycheck. You're not doing it just to keep your kids alive until they turn 18. You're doing it unto the Lord. Reverently, I referenced Romans 12.1. I talked about the last half of it, which is read your reasonable servants. But the, one of the parts that has always also captivated me is the phrase living sacrifice. You know what the problem with the living sacrifice is? is it keeps getting up off the altar. The problem with the living sacrifice is it keeps getting up off the altar. And when you kill a sacrifice and you lay it down, it's not going anywhere. But that's not what the Lord's asking us to do. He's saying for us to give our lives and to lay it down upon the altar of salvation, the altar of calling. He's saying lay your life down and to keep laying it down. To stay. And to present your body to the Lord. To present your life, your passions, your calling. Keep laying it down. 
But I'm afraid that too often our attitudes have us popping on and off the altar of sacrifice. We're faithful one moment and we're unfaithful the next. But the Lord is calling us to have a good attitude and to lay our lives down at His feet to be used for His glory. And then lastly, the only status that matters is our relationship with Jesus. Paul says, And masters, treat your slaves the same way without threatening them because you know that both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no favoritism with him. Jesus shows no favoritism. No matter the label the world puts on you, those labels are swallowed up in Jesus. Servant, master, husband, wife, child, parent, slave, free, Greek, Jew, Roman, it doesn't matter. The Lord does not love one more than the other because there is no favoritism. The Word says that God so loved the world and that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that every person who has ever breathed is in need of a Savior. We live in a world that is getting pretty creative with the labels. But the only label that matters is the label redeemed. The only thing that matters is Jesus, your Lord and Savior. And what I'm discovering is that a servant in Jesus' household is better than being a king in Satan's kingdom. Amen. And for us, the question to ask today is, where has Christ asked you to serve? Because I believe the Lord is calling all of us. For some, the calling for you is to remain faithful where He has placed you. For others, the Lord is preparing to move or transition you, but you have to trust Him and remain faithful. Regardless of where we are in this stage of life, you have to remember who you belong to. The Word tells us that we were bought with the price, the price of Jesus' blood. And when we give our lives to Jesus, we accept Him as Lord and Savior. And we must remain faithful, submissive, and obedient. So this morning, if you'll stand with me for just a moment or two, I want to lead us in a prayer of commitment today. Not quite sure where you're at, not quite sure what stage of, of life or your discipleship journey looks like, but I want to lead us in just a moment. And it's appropriate for us on occasion just to remind ourselves in the Lord, Lord, I'm yours. Use me, mold me, do whatever you need to do, want to. I am a servant in your kingdom. Use me as you see fit. Let's just take a moment. Lord, we come before you today. And we are reminded of the price of our redemption, which was nothing less than the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, when I'm reminded of what you did for me, when I'm reminded of all that you continue to do for me and the people that I love, how can I possibly look to you in the face and say no? So Lord, today, once again, I say yes. Yes to your will, yes to your plan, yes to your purposes, yes to your calling. Lord, once again, I say yes. Lord, for anybody in the room today who has heard about you, but they've not made you their Lord and their master, I pray, God, right now that you will lead us into that relationship where we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and we'll be saved. I pray, God, in the days to come, as you call us to deeper levels of obedience, that you will help us, that you will empower us, that you will equip us to be faithful with every step, to be trustworthy with every word, to be mindful of every attitude, so that we might be faithful servants of Jesus, the Most High King. So, Lord, thank you. Thank you for your calling. Thank you for your love. Help us to be faithful to you and your kingdom all of the days of our lives. May it be so. Julie, would you join me this morning? I'm going to take a moment. I'm going to linger just for a moment here. Don't forget. Don't forget the calling that God has given you. And the purposes and the plans that he has for your life. And don't let Jesus become anything less than Lord and Master of you. Just take a moment. We're going to pray for you as you leave.
you have a meet and greet right after, back in this back room over here? I'd love to hang out with you for a minute. Have baccalaureate on Wednesday. Thankful for a school district that still has baccalaureate in town. I'm thankful for the Lord's calling and His plans and purposes. Lord, help us to be obedient. And Lord, help me to not only be obedient with my actions, but also with my attitudes. So Lord, I pray that as you take all of us into deeper levels of service and obedience, may we walk faithfully and walk worthy of this calling you've given us. Would you make us aware of divine appointments and divine interruptions this week to share your love and your hope with those who need it most? Do you protect, provide, and minister to us, O oh Lord? And Lord God, we just pray right now for your help and your hope in the midst of our lives. Bless us at home, bless us at work, bless us in community. And Lord God, we give you thanks for this divine calling you've given us. May we walk worthy of it all, all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.